This is Dave Roberts. I am a special effects artist and set builder in the film industry. I provide FX on such projects as the Civil War combat series for the History Channel, War That Made America for public broadcasting, and over a dozen programs for historical films beginning with Antietam in 1997. We not only produce powerful and realistic FX, but we also design and build the structures that are damaged or destroyed while the cameras are rolling. Among those structures are the Dunker Church set for Antietam, the massive field fortification for Soldiers All, and an unfortunate downtown street in Fredericksburg, victim of the Yankee bombardment of the town during the Fredericksburg campaign in late autumn 1862. Another structure we designed for that project was built with no plans for its destruction, a 300-foot Civil War-era pontoon bridge, a replica of one of six Union Army bridges used to cross the Rappahannock River at Fredericksburg. This project was a massive undertaking. 14 24-foot long by 5-foot wide pontoon boats built from scratch over a 12-month period. This required us to procure 75 26-foot-long 4x6 choice, known as balks, and nearly 350 12-foot-long 2x12 planks, or chesses. We also needed three dozen 24-foot-long 4x4 stringers to be laid horizontally to provide rails on each side of the bridge deck to securely clamp the chesses between them and the balks. These rails also added significantly to the overall strength of each span at the same time. Each boat typically called for at least one if not two anchors to prevent either the wind or river currents from carrying the bridge away. And there were miles and miles of manila rope to hold the whole thing together. And lastly, but surely not the least, we had to recruit, train, and care for a crew of engineers, Civil War style, to erect the bridge when and where it was needed. That was the daunting task that faced us in 1999, with the shooting date facing us barely a year away, and with only one boat partially completed. That first boat was put to use right away, serving as a model for artist Brian Kirschensteiner, who had been asked to create the artwork for a monument to the 7th Michigan Infantry at Fredericksburg. Our artist is going to um, take bits and pieces from all the pictures that, he, that he's taken here and uh, sketch those, use those for sketch material. And uh, we're going to turn those sketches into a bronze plaque that'll go on that monument. Basically, I'll look at the source material first, see what I have there, uh, talk again with the members of the 7th, see exactly what they want, and start uh, some preliminary sketches based on this source material. As the artist, I try to draw from that sort of emotion, that collective stride toward taking that town. That's good. That's the rock over there, Bob. Oh, okay. There you go. An appropriate one-ton boulder was found deep in the Michigan woods. And Kirschenstein's concept was to create a bas-relief sculpture inset directly into one side of the rock face. They reported in a letter back to us that they've had some problem with people stealing bronzes off of uh, monuments on battlefields. But mm -hmm. one of the advantages of this one is it's going to be sitting really in the city of Fredericksburg on the side of the Rappahannock there, and it's going to be um, population around it and so forth. So it'd be mm -hmm. probably less likely to be uh, bothered. The monument was to be sighted at a place where the men of the 7th crossed and landed at Fredericksburg under enemy fire. This is slick. In order to make it possible for the engineers to finish their work, the regiment assaulted the town using the same pontoon boats meant to finish the bridge. Don't drag the boat, I don't want to see it. <laughs> These guys in the back, they look like they're out for a three hour tour. <laughs> Damn you, Rebels. All right, cast off, man. Cast off. Ooh, you're good. I'll get over to the That side. first boat, with a hardy group of Union Army reenactors, provided the perfect tableau for the sculpture.
Then, with the art modeling finished, the soldiers, stacked arms, took off their winter gray coats and went back to work on boat number two, or actually boats two, three, and four, as we now had our template and could work up the boats three at a time. Hey, how you doing? How are you? Construction took place in the barn of our friend Mike Doc Mitchell in Lansing, Michigan. That's when I went from boat builder to being a teacher and manager of volunteer carpenters fabricating three boats at a time. We're in the process now of dropping the inside chimes down across. It was the only way we would meet the shooting schedule set for the following year at Ferry Farm in Falmouth, just opposite Fredericksburg. Throughout this construction phase, I had the opportunity to work with a number of dedicated volunteers. In addition to Doc Mitchell, Michigan natives Gary Carpenter, Bradley Eakin, Eric Hagman, and his son Doug, along with Bruce Anderson, can be seen in these scenes. These men are individually modifying, then adding prefabricated rib pieces to the upside down form or mold used to provide the correct shape and dimensions for each boat as well as symmetry across all 14 boats that were eventually built. Marty Brubaker is from Maryland, and he brought his skills as a government accountant, keeping our calculations straight. What's half of 13, 10 and a half? Well, half of 13 is 6, 6. 6, 11 and a quarter. 6, 11 and a quarter. Okay, that's right. Six, 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 11 and a quarter. Math genius. Each boat contained 32 of the individually fitted rib pieces, creating an overall skeleton that provided strength and stability, not only for its deployment in the water, but for turning the boat onto its keel for transportation all the way to central Virginia, and for storage both before and after the film shoot. I think we've got this basic math down. These ribs were mass-produced by a father and son team, so they could be positioned and fastened once the overall frame was ready to receive them. More. Most of the boats were built in this way in Michigan, and then transported and stored at Fredericksburg National Military Park when they were finished. Several additional boats were constructed right there in Fredericksburg by the James Monroe High School carpentry and cabinet making class of year 2000. I had the pleasure of training and working with these students, and their contribution closed the gap for us as we neared the week of filming by delivering three more boats to the project. Here is what the pontoon boats looked like in 1862, each with its own carriage, ready for transport to a river that needed to be crossed. And here is what our boats looked like when finished and ready for bridge building in November 2000. A fully built bridge in 1862 looked like this. And here is our bridge on the cusp of the 21st century, fully built and ready for the wagons, horses, and soldiers of the Union Army of the Potomac. Although the Fredericksburg documentary involved this unusual undertaking, the project was not unique for the people at historical films. Full-scale film sets involving real structures built the way they were at the time is one of the hallmarks of this outfit. In fact, two full-scale fortifications were built in one year alone. A hybrid set of four all-wooden frontier forts was built atop Laurel Mountain in Pennsylvania for the PBS series on Colonial America. And another elaborate earthworks was constructed at Fort Pickett, Virginia for Soldiers All. So building a bridge, as long as the bridge is in 1862, was in keeping with this ethic of creating real settings using real materials. Ordinarily, if we don't blow up one of our sets, we have to dismantle it before leaving a remote location. But with the pontoons, we were determined to create a living set, and we eventually built the bridge for five separate productions. Our Fredericksburg documentary, made in partnership with the National Park Service, was just the first project. We built the bridge again for Hollywood's Gods and Generals feature film in 2002. And a portion of the bridge was built over a pond. We made that span look like the bridge over the Rapidan River during the Chancellorsville campaign. I'll mention the other two projects in a moment, but it's important to note that we fulfilled our ambition to use and reuse the boat bridge across a variety of film projects. 
However, Gods and Generals was the only project where all 14 boat sections were deployed. And the scenes we see now were captured during the construction of the bridge for that film project in November 2002. The location was a man-made body of water in western Washington County, Maryland, called Blairs Valley Lake. It's a long lake and approximately 500 feet across, too wide for our boat bridge. Fortunately, the lake narrows near the north end, and one particular spot gave us a crossing of about 320 feet. With each boat section, two boats with five bolts are joist in between, Spanning 20 feet of water, we were one boat section short of completing the crossing. Boat ramps were fabricated by the movie company, one for each riverbank, 10 feet on shore, which took care of the last 20 feet of water. That meant we had to meet the far side ramp where a one and a half inch wide ledge was ready to receive the last set of bolts. This scene shows us at a moment of intense activity as we pump out and refloat the boats already deployed. The boats had taken on water overnight and were in danger of sinking. In fact, Kenny Coneshock remained on the bridge all through the night, continually pumping out the boats already in the water. Why were the boats sinking? Like all wooden watercraft, the boats needed about 10 days of full immersion in order to swell and seal the open seams between the individual planks. But a week of that swelling had been shaved off our schedule by the pressing needs of the film company. We ended up swelling the boats in place, pumping out and bailing the boats throughout the entire construction phase of the project. This additional effort did not affect the boat's seaworthiness but it did create extra work and stress as the bridge sometimes became partially submerged, only to refloat after being pumped out. Several of our volunteers from the Michigan boat building were on hand. Eric Hagman and Marty Brubaker were joined by Jim Batchelder, John Neely, and Ken Coneshock. As for the first time, the boat bridge took shape running from one side of the river to the other. Here we can see Jim securing the side rails. This is probably one of the first times that we've uh, built a bridge like this since one of those wars back there when they use these boats. Right, so. Extending the bridgehead was sometimes done by bringing out a boat and then using the next set of five bulks to push it out another 20 feet or so. We can see how this is done in this rare colorized photo from 1910. West Point cadets learning how to build the same Civil War era boat bridge. Ten bulk pushers are set to extend the new bridgehead boat further out into the Hudson River. Five keepers are guiding the bulks as they move out, and five lashers are securing the far end of the bulks to the gunnel so that the pushers are actually moving the new boat. And look here, some 20 chessmen are bringing out the planking needed to make the bridge deck for the next 20 feet of bridge. What a wonderful find, this photo from early in the 20th century showing how engineers in the Civil War fabricated each bridge section until they had bridged the entire river. Towards the end of the process, we started to favor the catamaran method, positioning two boats end on to the shore about 20 feet apart, laying on the five bolts and loosely covering them with a portion of the chesses needed before shifting the section into place. By doing so, we created two bridge sections at a time when the catamaran was pushed out from the bridgehead, as we see here. We had two main concerns. We had carefully worked out how long it would take to transport and cure the boats. And, as we said, we lost a full week for that when the shooting schedule was moved up. And we knew how long it would take to construct the bridge. But as we began the work, we lost one full day so the producers could meet the needs of the actors and other production issues. And then there were the spatial concerns. The pilings for the two boat ramps were already in the water. The span we had to cover with our 14 boats was fixed. I figured I had one foot of leeway to play with in a 300 foot span. That's a tiny margin of error. Would our bridge fit into that preset space? 
The closer we got to the fast side, the more critical our calculation became. The foe advances light and free. Who meets them now, the infantry? To make up for the schedule changes, the time problem, my crew and I started before daylight and continued until lighting conditions became too dangerous. Ready? Now, as we neared the fast side, it appeared that we'd get there on time. Don't, look, don't use your fingers. Step on. Push it down. Step right on. Hard. All your way. But as we got closer and closer, that one and a half inch ledge looked smaller and smaller. Something we realized as we built the entire bridge for the first time, that the bridge kept getting longer and longer. With every new boat, we added 20 feet to the long walk out to the bridgehead. Carrying a 20-pound chest, or a 60-pound rail, or a 100-pound bulk to complete the next boat section. So as we narrowed that gap, we transported the last few section materials around to the far shore, cutting the hauling distance by 70 yards or so. And we could see Ken loading the bolts for the last boat from the far side ramp. And that's John Neely in the foreground at the bridgehead, ready to receive them. There, you see? Let's see that again. John demonstrates his flare for lassoing the end of the bulk and starts to rein in the whole section as Brad grabs on at the far end. Teamwork, and a bit of style to get the job done. Marty joins us at the new bridgehead, and suddenly... It's gonna reach. We can see it. It looks like we're gonna make it. The bulks that Kenny loaded are now being fitted onto the previous boat, with four feet of overlap, just like every other boat section. Wet. I'm replacing a rope that got wet with a fresh one, making the connection more secure. Now I want to point out that those nail guns you hear are not coming from our boys. That's the movie carpenters finishing up the boat ramp that we're about to connect with. No nails, no adhesives, no screws went into historical films boat bridge. No way. We built it the same way they did in the Civil War. Everything was held together with rope. This allowed the floating structure to give and move a little with the wind and water. And it gave the movie soldiers and actors a sense of matching over a real bridge floating on water. Those boats can be pretty stubborn. Here I'm calling for the boat to be moved to the left from your point of view. And Jim gets some leverage going with a pole. And we get the last boat into place. The boat ramp is finished. That crew is waiting. Brad goes in the water. And to borrow an old nautical term, we take a sounding. Hey, how long how far they overlap? It fits. Hey, my guy know it. We're gonna make it. <laughs> but of course, right? I knew it all the time. So we moved the last boat into position and put its bolts into place. Followed by the chesses and then the rails. That's Don Hubbard, known affectionately as Bugle Don for his musical talents, bringing out the last few rails. And then, all of a sudden, there it was ready to go the grass field right there to the point where the movie people could stand on it and plot out their scenes okay you can almost see them you can almost see those boys in 1862 marching across the bridge to Fredericksburg and the battle that awaited them by the time the last chest and rail went into place, it was nigh twilight, time to call it a night. What an unusual movie prop. I just want to, it's columns of fours that we've decided to go across. Yeah. Okay. A full scale, safe and functional pontoon bridge in the style of the portable bridges of the 1860s. Its design and portability was essential to the war effort. 
But when we get to this side to reset, we'll just turn them around and take them all the way to the other side. And uh, Joe and assistants will be here on this side to make sure the same thing happens. At the round step, march! Just follow the yellow brick road. With cameras rolling, whole regiments went across, along with horses and artillery. It became one of the hallmarks of gods and generals, and credit is due to writer-director Ron Maxwell for insisting on using our bridge for his movie. Historical films constructed the boat bridge for him at cost, but it was a considerable expense to add it to the movie's budget and schedule additional shooting days for the crossing and scenes like you see here. Our goal was to achieve something that hadn't been done quite this way since the Civil War, and to give the reenactors the experience of crossing a river like the veterans of that war. It's a unique sensation with the whole structure shifting side to side as the troops stepped onto the deck. But the basic structure with each part complementing the other pieces yielded a feeling of safety and security. There is nothing quite like it. As our director likes to say, it's as if you're walking on history. Historical films use the bridge at Fredericksburg, where we also filmed the riverine crossing of the 7th Michigan. In 1862, some 20 Michigan men were killed or wounded in that desperate crossing, which was followed up by the 19th and 20th Massachusetts. Their valor eliminated the sniper threat to the engineers. The bridges were finished and the Union Army began crossing, including the one at Ferry Farm downriver from the wrecked railroad bridge, the same location for Historical Films Bridge nearly 150 years later. A small pond at the Middle Car Farm just north of the Antietam battlefield provided one more opportunity to employ the bridge. Several of the boats, vaults, and chesses were even used to create catamarans to depict the movement of General Montcalm's artillery and army on Lake Champlain during the French and Indian War. This scene was filmed for the PBS documentary, War That Made America. And we constructed two more boats and a section of bridging for the National Park Service, creating an historical boat bridge display at Chatham across the Rappahannock from Fredericksburg. This exhibit is just above the crossing site that brought the 20th Massachusetts into the house-to-house -house combat that erupted after the bridges were completed in December 1862. In the midst of all this, Brian Kirschenstein had completed his bronze plaque and the one-ton boulder was transported to Fredericksburg. Then the 7th Michigan reenactors came to town, bringing with them a Confederate battle flag the unit had captured in 1862. This flag is a rare survivor of the events that took place on this very place. Events which have shaped our entire nation's history. The decision by the state of Michigan to return this flag to this community is perhaps the greatest gesture of reconciliation in this city since the Society of the Army of the Potomac was here in 1901. I would like to express the thanks to all of you who came from Michigan and it's a pleasure that I take in accepting this flag for the whole city of Fredericksburg and surrounding counties. We are proud to be able to use this flag to tell a story that is critical to the health of this nation and the future of this community. Thank you. Later that day, the monument was dedicated right where the 7th came ashore and made it possible for the engineers to complete their work. This monument's going to be a lasting and enduring testament to the bravery of the 7th Michigan at that point in the conflict. Emerson said that nothing great was achieved without enthusiasm, and that's what I'm really trying to find here, and there's really no struggle to find that in something like this. That monument also pays tribute to the effort that went into the fabrication of a pontoon bridge in our own time, early in the 21st century. But well, the image depicts the first boat in the construction of 14, and the hard work, time, and dedication of the volunteers who built the bridge for historical films, for gods and generals, for public broadcasting, and for the National Park Service at Fredericksburg. 
place. First of all, it was the first crossing attempted by Pontoon Bridge under fire. This is Dave Roberts thanking you for joining me in a look back at one of the most challenging but rewarding experiences in my career. My thanks goes to the dozens of boat makers, suppliers, and bridge builders who created this unique film set. I figured the entire prop, all 14 boats with all of the bolts and chesses and rails, and even some rope for the 15 spans over the 300 feet of water, all of it together comes to 11 tons of material. So for that, as well as for the hard work and camaraderie, I'd like to say I couldn't have done it without you. That's right.